Hi, uh, thank you all for being here. And um, here's uh, my information and the presentation for you to, to contact me with anything you, you need. And, and all the information at the presentation is, uh, goes uh, further to what we can uh, see now in, in just a few minutes. And I'm facing the very um, difficult task of uh, finding uh, links between uh, what's going on right now in uh, very different contexts like Syria and Spain. So uh, uh, it's uncomparable. I mean, uh, life in a democracy is uncomparable to, to, the, to what uh, Syria has become with, uh, with the killing machine that uh, the Syrian government has become for its own population. So even though they're uncomparable, I think, uh, well, they both have a lot to do with a new uh, way of understanding uh, being a citizen. So uh, that's why the presentation is called Citizen Mobilizations and the Internet and Decentralized Citizen Communications for Social Change. So, like we said, we're, they're very different contexts, but I'd like to, to see the common, the common ground for citizens. So, uh, in, um, in some cases, in very repressive regimes, we are witnessing how citizens are breaking the wall of apathy towards their own systems, towards their own regimes. So this is a picture of uh, Spanish citizens uh, just a couple of months ago in uh, Madrid main square in Spain. And uh, other citizens in uh, repressive contexts are breaking the wall of fear. And this is Syria. <coughs> Do we have a... Uh... Well, it's a video of uh, demonstrators at, um, at one of the, the Syria demonstrations of the past that have been passing up around the past few months. Is it? No, it's not. Uh, the video's not working. It's okay. I mean, we don't need it right now, but I'm going to need the, uh, the, the YouTube connection later. So, uh, so in both cases, uh, it's a, a wall of silence has been broken. Uh, around uh, certain issues, like uh, Zainab uh, commented on the importance of collective action. So it's, uh, it has a lot to do with uh, the, the boundaries and the uh, differences uh, that we are living now uh, between traditional narratives and uh, decentralized uh, communications that uh, uh, perform in very different ways. So in Syria, what is the context uh, in Syria right now? We are at a context of unprecedented brutality of uh, a government against its own population. Uh, media are owned by the government, and it has been so for, for decades now. And no international journalists are allowed. So within this context, we used to have only one reality of events. This is a banner on the Syrian official communication channel. It's called Sana. So they present themselves as the ones who give you the reality of events. And it is true, it was the only side to the reality of events until very recently. And this is one of their uh, articles on their website. And uh, they're, exp they're, they're showing how Syrian citizens uh, have uh, are carrying this uh, long uh, flag, long Syrian flag, like uh, Guinness record flag. They, they want to show that uh, the Syrian government is promoting the longest flag and that citizens support the government as an expression of Syria. So Syria and the Syrian people and the Syrian government are one. This is what the, the reality of events is according to the Syrian official channel. Well, this is Hama. Uh, a couple of months ago with uh, citizens in Hama in Syria, in the focus of resistance city, uh, carrying an even longer flag. So this is like uh, some kind of metaphor of uh, citizen reaction to this was unthinkable uh, only a few months ago. So it's uh, like a way for citizens to, to answer, you want flag? Here you go, here's a flag. There you go. And this was really, really unthinkable only a few months ago after decades of, of uh, repression in Syria. So um, what we're witnessing has a lot to do with the uh, citizen media, citizen narrative, citizens writing their own history, 
not only making it happen, but also writing it in contexts where journalists are not allowed, where international media are not allowed, so its citizens are performing a historic role in registering what's happening and sharing it with the world. And look at this. I mean, this is a very interesting uh, screenshot that I took of a video. And uh, it's, uh, I don't know if you've noticed the, the, the YouTube videos and the images of uh, demonstrators in the very, very uh, historic events in the region uh, and all citizen demonstrations all over the world. There are more, uh, more mobile phones than hands sometimes. So like every citizen realizes that they have a historic role at moments where if they don't share what's happening, maybe no one else will. And uh, this is a video that I want you to, uh, to see that uh, confirms what, I, what I'm telling you about uh, all these little lights that are mobile phones in the hands of citizens. And they're singing what has become a very popular like anthem of the Syrian revolution. They're singing, Erhal, Erhal, Ya Bashar, which means leave, just leave us alone. Bashar, go. And uh, this was also an, an unpronounceable sentence only a few months ago. So just take a look at this video. I just wanted to show you, it's impressive, the amount of people sharing what's happening, realizing that they, they have this historic uh, role to perform. Um, and this has a lot to do, what we are witnessing in Syria in particular, has a lot to do with, uh, with uh, YouTube and with mobile phones uh, em enabling citizens to get empowered, okay? It's citizens that make revolutions. That's of course, uh, that's obvious that uh, some of my, my uh, colleagues have uh, talked about. The citizens risking their lives, as usual. But I really have a hard time imagining uh, how um, we could be watching what's happening in Syria without YouTube. And if you pay attention to all the Al Jazeera videos, to everything we hear from Syria, it's uh, mainly videos recorded by citizens from within, because there is no one else to do it. And um, so what, what is next? What is the, the context we are, what is the, where are we going with this uh, tension between traditional narrative and citizen uh, narrative? Well, it, we are at a cat and mouse game between governments and activists that would only get more and more intense, more and more dangerous. So this is on the streets, like it's always been, and the, and the dangers are, are physical. They're not, uh, not at all virtual, the dangers are physical. And the video that I just showed you before, the Irhar Irhar Yabashar, was sung, but that song was, has become popular, um, popularized by, um, by just an activist, a demonstrator called Ibrahim Kashush, who sang it in every demonstration in Hama, and it became famous worldwide. It became the, the symbol of uh, Syrian resistance. And um, obviously, YouTube uh, made it go uh, spread worldwide. But um, to silence the protesters and to show what happens to people who speak up in Syria and for you to realize what, really, what, what we're talking about, really, um, Ibrahim Kashush was found dead a month ago with his vocal cords ripped off. As a metaphor of what happens to whoever in Syria dares speak up. So this is what we're dealing with. However, Ibrahim Kashush, is on, is, is his voice is going to be there forever. YouTube videos are unstoppable. Um, the government is increasingly frustrated and, and about, uh, about technology like YouTube and talks about the moral uh, corruption of the West uh, as symbolized by technology like YouTube. So silencing the, the, the voice and um, delegitimizing the technology, the means. Those are the, the two ways that are being used um, to repress demonstrators. So like we said, the dangers are on the streets, the dangers are online. The persecution is very much via mobile more and more because citizens use mobiles more and more. 
So uh, we, we, get, we get to the extent of having internet completely shut down, like we did in Egypt. And we have uh, the map showing the, the peak here, where uh, Syrians have been disconnected of the internet, mobile phones as well. So, I mean, they, they go as far as this. If some, I see some of you taking pictures, go ahead. And uh, this is all on the presentation that I will uh, post on Twitter as soon as we're done. And, um, well, this is uh, also, I mean, uh, the war against technology is very obvious by the Syrian authorities. So this is a uh, capture showing uh, the, the weapons taken. Oh, I'm sorry. Taken uh, by uh, demonstrators. Does this have to do with my phone? Because I wanted to take a picture of you. That's why it's on. Okay, so uh, this is a capture showing um, the weapons that demonstrators, uh, what the government calls terrorists, are using. So they include uh, sticks and axes and, and mobile phones with foreign SIM cards, if you pay attention. So mobile phones are included as uh, weapons um, against uh, stability and national security. And uh, like we said, this war between uh, traditional, this tension between traditional official narratives and citizen narratives uh, shows in, in the videos, in the ways that citizens are trying to protect themselves. There's a, a strong concern about the importance of protecting identity of users. So this is a screenshot of um, users who have their faces blurred. So more and more activists, I don't know if you've noticed, they try to record videos from behind so that faces don't show. Because like Lena said, this is a double-edged sword. Visibility is good, visibility helps activists, but the visibility exposes activists as well. So more and more citizens are trying uh, to, to work on ways to protect themselves while demonstrating. So this is like a proof of uh, how they're doing it. They're blurring the faces manually. But there's a need, and, and if you guys work uh, in, the, in the software developing world, um, there's a, a real need for more technology on, uh, on this area to protect users. And this is what uh, organizations like Witness are doing. I don't know if uh, this video is not working now. Again, it's not very important, I can tell you, but it's a video. But it, it's here. actually finding the face. It's a, it's a technology that uh, developed on Android, Android mobile phones, that actually uh, allows you to blur the faces of the people while you're recording them. So you don't have to do all this editing manually. So uh, I'm talking to, to the witness people now, I've had a, a reunion with them, because they, uh, they were asking us what can they do to help Syrian uh, activists. I mean, they're really concerned about that. And I'm really, really impressed by the citizen solidarity we are worldwide. And this is something to be really excited about. So I told them that uh, the, whenever they have this software ready, which they're working on, it's going to be extremely helpful for Syrians, because the government is using these videos to identify sometimes through crowdsourcing, sometimes pressuring Syrians to tell them who is this person, where does he live? So this is very useful and see how it works. Actually finding the face. I can move, it'll track them. And you can actually t tap on the face and it'll do something, maybe, anyway. So there we go, so this is on Android using the Google Android built-in, uh, oh, so they're just ex extracting the face. So it's using the built-in. So witness.org is working on this, an NGO uh, that does uh, human rights promotion through video. So activists are also using Tor technology like um, Skype is, uh, so is uh, apparently more, I'm not an expert on this, but Skype is apparently safer in Syria than other ways, than, of course, m safer than mobile phones. And international communications are all very, very monitored. So they're using Skype, they're using Tor, they're using virtual private networks and other technologies. But, and it seems like what communications battle is won by the citizens. So uh, government, Syrian government has lost the legitimacy that it had for four decades. So uh, communications battle is won, seems to be won by citizens now. 
at a, at a very high price with a lot of sacrifice. But the weapons are still in the hands of those who have the power over people's lives. So we will witness more and more attempts to delegitimize activists in, uh, in Syria and uh, to, show, uh, to, to portray them associated with violence, associated with attempts to destabilize the country. And, uh, and we will see an increase in this uh, distance between the very official narratives that hardly anyone believes anymore and uh, the very decentralized uh, ways of citizen communications that the internet has uh, made possible. Before we go on, I'd like to ask you for a favor, if it's possible. And I don't know if you could give me um, hands up for uh, Syrian freedom, and I'll cherish the on Twitter when we're done. It's okay. We raise up our hands for Syrian freedom. And uh, we we'll try to encourage the Syrian activists. Sounds good. Okay. So, just give me, <laughs> just give me ten seconds so we can do this all in real life. <laughs> At square two. There you go. Okay. So, thank you <laughs> for the contribution. This was just a quick break before we go and see a very different context, which is uh, the Spanish context. And I've been uh, very, very amazed that uh, after um, years where nothing seemed to happen in both of my countries, Syria and Spain, and all of a sudden I find myself in the middle of uh, uprisings and mobilizations everywhere. And all of my friends and all of the people I know are involved in, uh, in uh, citizen uh, initiatives. So what is happening in Spain? I don't know how familiar you are, but the context in Spain is very different. It is a situation where political corruption has reached very, very high levels. Unemployment has, uh, is beyond uh, 20%, which is a lot in a, uh, in a like, first world country. And uh, there's a growing distance between citizens and political representatives. So again, um, yeah. So this is Puerta del Sol in Madrid, the, seven, the May 17. Thousands and thousands of citizens demonstrating to demand changes, to demand a more participatory democracy. So citizens went out and took public spaces, took the square, and took the internet as well. And they're not uh, occupying it, they're taking it back. They're taking back the public spaces that belong to citizens, actually. So this, uh, the mobilizations in Spain that started on May 15, after a big, big demonstration where citizens decided to camp out at Madrid Main Square as a protest, as, a, as their, their need for something to change, as their need for democracy to, to be inclusive of their citizens, uh, is something very local that has to do with a lot of local issues within the country. And this is a an citizen assembly, citizen uh, discussing specific issues that they had to organize uh, at one of the campouts the first day. And at the same time, it's very global. I don't know if you've seen uh, images like this, but it really, really gives me goosebumps to these days. These are Egyptians holding a, a poster that says, from Tahrir to Puerta del Sol, democracy for all. So even Egyptians have realized that something big was happening in Spain, and, and the, the mobilizations in Spain have, an extremely, ha, have reached an extremely global scope. And again, it has a lot to do with this distance between very traditional structures, both political and media-wise, and decentralized citizen communications. 
And uh, this was very, very visible through Twitter, through the way city, uh, mobilizations were organized, campouts in different uh, cities were organized in Spain, and how it reached other countries in solidarity with what became uh, called the Spanish Revolution. So it started with the tag 15M, then Acampada Sol, then Yes We Camp, it made it uh, worldwide. Acampada Barcelona, Acampada Valencia, Acampada Sevilla, Spanish Revolution, Acampada Buenos Aires, Acampada Jerusalem, Jerusalem. So it, campouts and demonstrations happened everywhere in the world in solidarity with the Spanish awakening, the Spanish citizen awakening. And this is, uh, I, have never, I haven't seen in other cases, uh, like in the MENA region countries, uh, these decentralized ways, like different tags came up every day, replaced one another. Every day they made it uh, to, to global trend. And there wasn't, there wasn't one specific tag. There were hundreds of tags replacing one another. The, the nature of the movement was very chaotic and at the same time very effective, and it reached uh, very, very global audiences in a very short amount of time. And um, it gave an opportunity to citizens and to small independent uh, media, like Periodismo Humano, that I'm a contributor for, to share what was happening from the beginning. Um, and this contrasts with the fact that traditional media were not there from the beginning. So a lot was already going on when traditional media managed to get there and understand that something big was happening. So this really, really exposed uh, the gap between the old ways, both politically and media-wise, and the new ways, and the new organic ways, and the new formats, and the new ways to flow that citizens have found, and the really, really uh, contrast with these traditional narratives. So citizens did it in their, on their own, from the beginning, they started sh uh, sharing what was happening, videos, pictures, uh, uh, live streaming, independent, small independent medium were there to support them, but uh, traditional media and traditional structures fell short of, uh, of understanding what was happening until it was already uh, well, well into the process. And this is a very interesting uh, uh, sentence, a poster at the, at the Madrid Puerta del Sol that shows this distance between traditional narratives and new narratives. It says, we're sorry, we don't have a leader here so you can defeat us. So it's a decentralized movement organized in a decentralized way with no leaders, with no hierarchies, with no vertical ways that you can actually go and tackle, which is uh, what uh, traditional structures are used to, to doing. And um, this is a tweet of a, of a Spanish lawyer who, who mentioned uh, that the problem of the movement is not that it, it does not have a visible head. It is that um, the power structures don't know where to cut it. So not having a head is not a problem for citizens organizing. It's a problem for whoever wants a head that they can cut and they can't find it. So what is next in Spain? Well, the same as uh, I think everywhere where we have this tension, more and more attempts to delegitimize activists. And more and more we are seeing now images that tend to associate the Spanish movement with a criminalized attitude, with criminalizing, criminalized attitudes and behaviors associated to social exclusion or, or it's just that there are just a few hippies camping out instead of what it really is and what it has been from the beginning, a very, very diverse citizen movement of people of all ages, of all backgrounds, of all kinds. And, um, and uh, more and more we see these attempts to delegitimize it in, uh, through, through public um, spheres. And citizens will go on as they, they have, uh, or working in, in uh, projects where they can actually um, keep organizing and keep working and keep developing specific ideas of what they want uh, to see change. And um, one of the very, very interesting projects that uh, has happened after the movement or within the movement was the creation of this uh, platform, which is an uh, open source uh, social platform, which uh, poses an alternative to private uh, networks, private platforms like Facebook, where uh, users are not uh, the owners of their own data, 
of their own activity online. So uh, initiatives like uh, n-1.cc uh, have been uh, developed by Spanish citizens so that uh, citizens had their own spaces instead of depending on someone else's spaces. So this is the way it's working now and a lot of people in Spain are, are using this now instead of uh, Facebook to organize. So just to conclude, uh, we are uh, at a very exciting uh, year, 2011. It seems like years ago that Ben Ali fell. It's only been a few months. A lot has happened. It's going so fast. Where the, the word citizen has somehow reached uh, or acquired a new meaning and uh, citizen empowerment uh, through the, all the new possibilities this uh, involves. So, um, you know, this is an image that I like of uh, this convergence between uh, what was happening in Syria, what was happening in Spain. This is a demonstration in Spain to support Syria. So it says, Syria is not alone. Sol, Puerta del Sol in Spain, uh, where demonstrators camp out, Sol is with Syria. So it seems like citizens are getting together and, uh, and this uh, in, a, in a global way to tackle global needs, although uh, there are specific local um, uh, ways to organize, of course, and, and issues to, to tackle. And I hope this uh, becomes and stays the way to address these very global challenges. So I would like to end by just uh, playing two minutes of this video if we have a connection. Is there a voice? Yeah. So this is a video that's called uh, Voices Are Coming. So it shows how voices uh, have uh, come from the south of the Mediterranean, um, like uh, Arab countries, and they have uh, flew up, they flew up and reached uh, the north of the Mediterranean and then spread around. So it shows uh, the role of citizen voices um, in the Mediterranean basing, getting, getting uh, this uh, together.
Well, the video is very long. It was quite long. It's a little bit uh, to go, and but you can find it on the presentation and uh, uh, whatever you you guys need. Please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. And uh, well, very happy to be here with you today. Thank you, guys. All right. Excellent. Those were three amazing presentations about four incredible movements that have taken place over this past year. And we have a little bit of time, at least 20 minutes, we might go a little bit overboard into the lunch. Uh, to bring this into a real discussion with everybody, you can also ask questions via Twitter using the hashtag uh, square2. I'll make sure to be checking that. I want to start with a quick question for all three of you. One thing that we have yet to discuss today is the role of high youth unemployment, which seems to be the one characteristic that defines all of the countries where major protest movements have happened this year. And some writers have even said, if youth unemployment was not so high, that these protests would not have taken place. Do you agree with that? What do you think about the role of unemployment and, and protests? Um. I think that the role of unemployment was very important in the protests. In Tunisia, for example, um, the protests started with young people who, who have their diplomas and who couldn't uh, get jobs. So they, when they saw that another young man um, set, uh, set his uh, body on fire because of unemployment, they just took to the streets and started the protests. So uh, unemployment is very important for the beginning of uh, these social movements which turned into political movements. In Spain, Syria? Yeah. Well, it's definitely a cocktail of uh, a lot of things and uh, I really don't know what the formula is for the ingredients to make this uh, really like explode in, in different uh, contexts. But it definitely when you have, like you have in, well, I think it's uh, in the whole Mediterranean area, you have a uh, very, very prepared, well-educated people who have uh, no expectations, who have, uh, who have been taking their future away. So in Spain, one of the, one of the like slogans of, of uh, the protests were, was, um, uh, we are a youth uh, without a future. We, we want our future back. So when young people don't see uh, possibilities ahead, don't see, don't see a future, don't have expectations, of course, this is uh, going to create uh, uh, huge uh, social tensions. Well, it's hard to do a counterfactual, uh, what would have happened. But clearly, you know, youth unemployment along with the rising food prices, energy prices, all of that were important factors. I also think that um, there was also a movement to what um, Leila said is to reclaim their future. So it's not necessarily they wanted a job uh, because a number of the protesters that I talked to, they had a job. But it was sort of the stagnating regime which was just they, where they saw no positive role for themselves and for the kind of country they wanted to be. But it's part of the mixture, no doubt, but I think it's very complicated and it's not just that. Okay, before we ask the audience for some questions here, I want to take one question from Twitter. This is from the user Lexi D, who asked, I'm, I'm reformulating the question a little bit, but is social media as empowering for minority cam minorities campaigning for their rights as for large majority movements. So we saw here, as Zainab said, that these are rulers that nobody likes. The majority right. of people are against them. What about Berbers in Tunisia and Egypt, for example, or immigrant communities in Spain? Are they using these tools effectively? Well, let me just say, I think that's a very good point, is that in some cases where there's already polarization on the ground, social media can accelerate those polarizations. I mean, it's great for a unified cascade, but I think we saw this in the uh, case of Bahrain, is that partly, um, and I'm not saying that the dissidents should not have done this, but what I'm saying is that sort of the tensions over social media probably made things harder uh, 
but on the other hand, you might have said without social media, there might not have been as many voices. So it might work against, if there's a polarized situation, it might work against the movement if it starts a polarization cascade, increased tensions, inflammatory statements uh, that are hard to walk back. So it's not, it, whatever's on the ground, you can think of it as an amplifier. Though it gets very complicated when you have minority ethnic divisions, strifes, and I'm hoping that uh, this kind of prediction gets made for every new media that the person-to-person -person contact will over time make us all closer. Usually doesn't happen. I'm hoping that for the internet maybe it'll be different and maybe we'll find a way to sort of unite rather than keep uh, making divisions worse. No, it was uh, interesting in Spain we had uh, um, immigrants who were like very integrated in uh, the movement, in the assemblies, in the organization of committees. So, uh, I mean, they too have uh, many concerns and many issues about their rights and uh, their situation uh, in the country. So uh, they have been working hand in hand uh, with, uh, with the rest of, uh, of uh, Spanish people. Um, because uh, the thing with uh, Spanish movement is that there are some specific uh, issues to be tackled, like uh, changes in the electoral law and uh, transparent lists, uh, devices to control corruption. But there are also very, like, more uh, um, vague issues that haven't been uh, really been specified yet and have a lot to do with uh, rights of all different kinds, with uh, women's rights, with uh, immigrants' rights. So the thing with uh, the Spanish movement is that it's very inclusive, so it seems like somehow everything uh, fits in there. Well, you, you talked about Berbers. Actually, in Tunisia, Berbers are integrated in, in the Tunisian population, so they are not really using internet or social networks to 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 advocate their their rights. They are part of the population. They are enjoying the same rights. So. Well, the situation of women in Tunisia is relatively good in comparison to the situation of women in other countries. Women are using our, uh, internet as uh, men uh, are using it, so they are using it now uh, with the rise of the Islamist movement in Tunisia to, to try to, uh, to keep their rights, to, to try to say we are here, we are not going to uh, let these Islamists, uh, these extremists take our rights. Let's move this discussion out to the entire room. Some questions right at the very front. Hi, Mark Kramer. It's more of a question statement. I, I tweeted it to you, but then the reason I tweeted it was because I, I have this sort of like revolutionary fatigue and also this fatigue of observing things mediated. So it's like, why am I tweeting a question when I can actually be a participant? That's sort of the <laughs> statement question. But there's a, there's a quote that's very controversial that every government or democracy, so to speak, has the government that they deserve. I'm paraphrasing that, whether that's Tocqueville or Thompson or Matz, I'm not sure. So why is it that we're experiencing this now in mostly areas which are Islamic regions or in the Mediterranean? And why isn't this happening in Finland or Denmark? That's sort of the controversial question statement. And also, is why does everything have to be mediated? Why do I have to observe your revolution? Why can't I start my own? Or what is the purpose of me watching your revolution? I'm just being controversial, but I'm actually here for you. I can, I can answer if you want. Well, I'll, I'll start with the last part. I think watching other people's revolution has inspired and ignited uh, this uh, happening everywhere, everywhere else. Like, it is happening in Spain. Um, it's something quite unprecedented, the, what we're witnessing in, uh, in Europe as well. And uh, it, it has a lot to do with the inspiration and, and this uh, watching and this uh, mediatization of uh, citizen needs and, and concerns. And uh, I think it's very, very useful and very necessary that, uh, that uh, we watch these things because they were invisible 
until very recently. And these uh, populations, uh, I don't know if they deserve such uh, horrible destinies and fates. Uh, I'm, I certainly doubt it. But uh, it has a lot to do, I think, with the geostrategical interests that these governments have uh, stayed there for, for decades. So um, until very recently, like I was talking to, to uh, Ingrid now, and, we were, and she was telling me that she, she wasn't aware that the Syrian government was that, that cruel until now. And that's the case with uh, everyone. I mean, everyone who's not a Syrian uh, or, or around the area did not realize the, the amount of repression and cruelty of, uh, that these governments were imposing on their own populations. So everything reaches uh, a point where uh, things somehow with a lot of uh, different uh, influencers uh, explode but, um, but uh, geostrategical interests have managed to uh, maintain these governments and uh, legitimizing them uh, through, uh, through invisibility sometimes and lack of attention to, to repression in these countries. So the fact that they're now visible, that we can watch it, I think uh, it's uh, fundamental. And it, uh, it, uh, it uh, has a very important impact in uh, citizens all around the world um, uh, and organizations and political structures sympathizing with something that they were not aware was, uh, was that uh, dramatic until very recently. Well, I, I want to say a couple of things. One is, um, when, I say, when I was in Egypt and I would talk to people and they say, oh, Turkey's so great, and I would start complaining about my own government and what it's doing, and they'd be like, oh, we'd be so happy if we got to have those problems. Because they were dealing with 30 years of routine torture, brutality. So one answer is in Finland, in Denmark, they don't have, you know, Gaddafi ruling for 40 years with people disappearing into jails and routinely torture, and they have elections. Uh, so whatever else problems might be with the Western democracies, and you can have, you know, I can list as many as you, but the kind of brutality, the day-to-day -day brutality that I got told again and again, and now we're seeing, is really, um, I don't want to minimize that. I don't want to pretend like there are no problems, but it's really hard to imagine, I think, for us. And we can have alternative means and social movements. We can you know, have our protests. And we can have elections in ways they cannot. And to respond to the why, the mediation has its limits. You know, tweeting instead of talking, you're here. And we can obviously you know, look you in the eye and say something. But on the other hand, if you tweet, we can also extend the conversation to whoever might not be here. So I think I, I like to see it more as like this, again, rather, rather than a binary, this new network. And in fact, one of the, I would say one of the uh, dynamics that was going on in 2010, 2011, uh, when these revolutions were happening, is that a lot of the key bloggers, tweeters, the people who acted like a bridge to the outside world, we had or they had met each other in person previously. So they knew who to trust. Uh, they knew who was there or not. So it's just this, um, I mean, instead of either or, I think the interesting thing is what's happening when it's a plus or square square, I guess, public square square. That kind of brings us back to that. Other questions yeah, here and then back there? I would like to know. How do you think can you close the um, communication? Probably there's a gap between the classical worker who started with strikes in Suez, Tanta, Gafsa, and the media activists who are in totally different worlds. They're from not in totally different worlds. No, no, no. In Egypt, if you go, if you talk to people, you know, like something like the, Europe, uh, the Egyptian Initiative for Human Rights, they give the workers, the striking workers, they trained them in citizen journalism and then they uploaded. I mean, the worlds are so integrated. This is, I mean, I'm like, I think my goal here today is to knock down these binaries. They are not separate worlds and you see this increasingly. And in fact, um, a lot of sort of the citizen journalist activists that you know of on Twitter, you'll find them really involved with exactly what you're talking about. It's not as separate as just my first point. Okay, and moving to the back. Uh, I also tweeted this. Um, 
The, my question is about what I feel is a giant elephant in the room unmentioned, which is China. And I feel that the, the techniques that you're talking about and the, the methods that you've been discussing in these talks aren't particularly useful in a society where internet censorship and, and internet, uh, internet monitoring are so firmly entrenched as they are in China. And even the arrest of one of the most famous artists in the world barely makes a dent in the consciousness of the, in the reaction to that arrest of Ai Weiwei barely makes a dent in the consciousness of the government. Have you thought about what tools can be used for a population which does not have sufficient access to the internet, even when it's there, but just that it's, it can't be trusted? We can speak briefly about that, but I do want to comment that you're definitely going to want to be here this afternoon, because we have Hu Yang with us, who is a fantastic new media scholar from China, I plan to who's be. going to be speaking exactly about that. Did anyone want to offer well, I don't comments? want to constantly talk about it. One thing I want to say is that the amount of censorship and surveillance effort that the Chinese government puts, in, puts into the internet is so high that it makes me think they know something we might not know about how potent the situation might actually be. And I'm really going to be watching the afternoon panel for more discussion. We have time for two or three more questions. Let's go back to Twitter real quick, and then we'll go here, and then we'll end there for the third and last question this morning. Going back to Twitter, and uh, this is user Kritzi Kratzi, who has the blog superduper.org, which is a great URL. The question I'm going to interpret more broadly, the question is, so if you use, um, if you start blurring faces on the video, how does that affect credibility? But I want to think more in terms of anonymity in general. Uh, is it important for activists to use the real name? Or is it OK for an activist to be anonymous? When you start using these filters for videos to blurring faces, I mean, we were talking last night about how some of these Chinese photographs of protesters during the Jasmine Revolution were actually just crowds of people who were misinterpreted as protesters. Is that something that could happen in other places? I think the price uh, for showing your real identity is too high. So I, I think we have to keep working on, uh, on, on that, uh, along that line to protect the uh, users. And um, I think what matters when it comes to really gathering information from these countries, like as journalists maybe working outside of these countries and trying to get information from there, is to have like a real network of people that you trust. So uh, like having real links and bonds that you have uh, of people who you can trust in each uh, different context, I think it's what makes the difference. Because I really uh, don't want to see, um, I, I don't want to see the people who I, who I follow on Twitter and their nicknames uh, who work from Syria. I, I don't really want to see them expose their real names and identities. It's just way too dangerous. I'd rather have to double check and contrast and do a hundred uh, um, follow-ups to, to make sure that something is, uh, is uh, trustworthy than having them expose their real identities. I mean, it's a life or death situation. Okay, let's go here. Yes, I'm, in, I'm very interested in the, the back and forth between the relevance of the role of the uh, social media and their sort of lowered relevance. From Lena to uh, Zeynep, we've heard back and forth arguments about this. Uh, several comments that I'd like to make. First of all, the role of WikiLeaks in, let's say, Tunisia and Egypt. Uh, clearly, it doesn't matter how many people knew about WikiLeaks in, uh, directly in, in either country because of and I was sort of given more weight to this particular argument, if there have been several other attempts at revealing the, the, the uh, of resisting the government in Tunisia, let's say, or in Egypt, the mere fact of hearing about WikiLeaks, which was actually in both countries uh, much discussed, I'm sure, in the, in the main media, because there was no censorship about that, that would have encouraged enormously people. It would be one more motivation for them to go and protest. That would be the first thing I would say. The second thing is the whole world's watching. I thought that was a wonderful image. But it also tells us something which is important, which is that local opinion is not local anymore. In other words, when things happen in some place, somewhere, the local opinion takes over before the social media. Thanks to social media, that's not the case anymore. 
It's now global. The whole world really is watching. And the example for that is that um, the uh, uh, Twitter, the role of Twitter quite was really minimal locally, and very few people were really uh, doing Twittering. But the moment one Twitter, one Twitter gets out, it's outside the country that it makes the, make, the, makes the big difference. And the last thing I wanted to, to suggest, and I'm asking a question about this, when the blackout of internet ha happened in Egypt, uh, several s small organizations began to relay, um, of course, illegally, the whatever internet connection were still available, and was actually giving internet. And I'd like to know your opinion about if that was really effective or if it's just like a, a nice symbolic, symbolic gesture. Well, I'll talk about the blackout. I think by the time the blackout hit, a cascade had started and I was following everything in real time. And the, the spread of news and videos did not stop. It might have slowed, but the activists on the ground using the NUR, that was the, the ISP that was still up, using dial-up, using this, using that, were able to continue some level of communication so we still had an idea of what was going on. And internally, what I heard a lot of people say is that, one, it pissed a lot of people off, uh, and two, it made people a little more anxious to figure out what was going on by going to the street itself. Uh, so by the time it happened, the only thing it could have prevented was if protests were being coordinated via the internet, but by then everybody knew Tahrir, and there was a lot of local protests that spread up. Uh, one activist told me uh, that, and you guys remember when Tahrir, the, the Mubarak regime sent camels and thugs to Tahrir, uh, like they sent thugs and camels to trample the protesters. And this was a horrific day. People were killed and you know it's a horrible thing. But what he told me was they were like looking at it and saying, is this guy for real? I mean here they are using satellite phones and speak to tweet to upload this and break into this network and you know do this really high level internet age social movement and this guy is sending us it's not even 20th century, it's 19th century or 18th century. So in that regard, I think the mo activists were ready for it and were able to counter it and internally it was just too late. Uh, persistent censorship like in China you have, that's a different ball game than unplugging after the dam is broken. That's my impression from... Lena and Leila, to, to also add on to Derek's question, rephrase it a little bit, I was listening to an interview with a journalist in Tripoli, in Libya, who said that he was watching Al Jazeera, and someone on Al Jazeera said, the rebels have taken, I forget what square, but some square in Tripoli. And so immediately he said, wow, this is a big news item, I need to go down there and interview people. He went down there and nobody was there, there were no rebels. And he said, what's going on here? And then 30 minutes later, the rebels arrived. <laughs> and he said, wow. <laughs> Al Jazeera is really good at, at getting a story before it even happens. And it's because the rebels have become very adept at using social media, at using their media contacts. How, what is the international media, how have they portrayed the protests and the movements in Tunisia and in Syria and Spain? Are those faithful representations, what we're getting in the English language press? Is that really what's happening in those three countries? Well, I was uh, surprised that uh, Spanish um, media uh, were uh, gathering uh, information from the, the Syrian official news channel. And uh, I don't know if you follow the Syrian news channel for a while, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's completely surreal. I mean, it, uh, there's no way uh, like a journalist who, who has been working for a while doesn't realize the amount of lies, the amount of fabrication. Uh, there's no test that, that uh, this uh, information can pass. So um, I, I'm, I'm worried that when uh, international media portray uh, these events, they try to give um, a fake sense of balance between uh, demonstrators and the government as if there was um, a balance to be found by uh, giving a voice to both sides, as if there, was, uh, as if there were sides 
instead of um, governments on the one hand repressing the population uh, on the other and controlling media and controlling all the, the communications. So um, yeah, you see these attempts to give uh, voice to and, and gather information from the official news channel. Um, but otherwise, I'm, um, I'm impressed as well that citizens have managed to, to get uh, their narrative and their contents out of the country because for 40 years that hasn't happened. Like in 1982, uh, thousands of Syrians were massacred in the town of Hama and uh, there's not like a single picture of that massacre, uh, not a video, nothing. And now, I mean, contrast, compare that to the hundreds and thousands of contents that we have that are created by citizens. So uh, main media, I mean, most media are just uh, using those materials because they cannot uh, send journalists to those uh, repressive uh, countries. So they're using the, the stuff that uh, activists are sharing. Well, I think that uh TV channels, uh, international TV channels like Al Jazeera did a good job during the, the events in Tunisia. They, they were giving the right news, but after January 13, uh, 14th, sorry, things changed. Al Jazeera started giving uh, false news, like for example, the, the death of the brother of uh, Leila Ben Ali, the, the wife of the ex-president, uh, uh, the guy is alive, but Al Jazeera said that he is uh, he's dead. So, yeah, um, these TV channels started giving the news without really checking it. They are collecting news from cyber activists or people who say that they are cyber activists. I think that this is not good, that they have really to check uh, news before broadcasting them to the whole world. Also, there's uh, like very quickly, there's this trend to cover one revolution and then jump to the next one and then jump to the, well, okay, bring it on. What's happening now? Where should we go? Uh, instead of following these processes and how they're evolving and how these transitions are happening, which is as important as the moment where the very shiny stuff happens. For example, Al Jazeera is not covering what's going on in Bahrain and I think this is shameful. A massacre is going on in Bahrain and Al Jazeera don't even talk about this. Okay, we have one final question. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Do you have a question? You are working very hard. Is there any hope of winning? I mean, is there any hope of uh, getting settled in these countries, a so-called democracy. Thank you. If, uh, if, uh, I mean, if, if we're winning, if, we're have, if we'll be seeing uh, like uh, transitions into healthy democratic regimes, what do you think about Tunisia? I think is the best case right now because Syria is uh, in a really hard position yet. Well, uh, Hopefully we'll, we'll reach democracy. It's not uh, so easy, but we are continuing to work to get real democracy. We can't have democracy in a few months. It's uh, a long and hard work to do, so hopefully we'll reach democracy. Now we can't really say if we'll have democracy or not. We're, we're past time by about 10 minutes, but we have one last question here, and then you can, well, during the lunch period, I guess we have two more questions. And then during the lunch period, please continue to ask questions. We also have a final discussion period at the end of the day in which everyone, we're gonna tackle some of these questions about where everything is going toward the future. But go in here now. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's not really a question, but uh, I think it's great uh, discussions that has been going on here, and uh, my contribution is the, the uniqueness of these social medias. Um, as the way conversation has been going on and the way I see the name of Zainab instead of name of Lina, the way it was quickly edited and the way people look at it like, ah, is that Zainab, is that Lina? No. And then in a matter of 10 seconds, the right information came. I think the, the uniqueness <coughs> of social media, it helps a lot to make people uh, comfortable, communicating, participating, and these are the things that we, need, we needed. But 
broadly, it doesn't really trigger the revolutions uh, tendency that is happening now. It just give out the, um, how can I say, the trust that I trust I can go out and, and participate. Because in the last 20 seconds, this information was this way, it was already edited, and now I trust millions of people have already contributed. So I'm, I'm in. So I think that is, the, that is the biggest thing. How many people are using it? This is the matter of technology, it's the matter of uh, wealth, it's the matter of um, uh, developing and, and underdeveloping, which is a very big topic that we cannot, we cannot discuss about it. Thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. I, I just wanted to say I, I'm deeply impressed about everyone who is actually in fear of his or her life to put information out in the public, uh, how it happened in, in that countries. And uh, especially since I work for an Austrian platform who wants to facilitate uh, more civil courage, more courage for people in Austria itself. And it's so much more easier here than it's somewhere else. And I put that on, on, on Twitter and I just wanted to tell it here to, to, the, to all of the people. It would probably be interesting to nominate the citizen journalists for the Nobel Peace Prize. And if anyone wants to work on that and wants to help me working on that, maybe we can discuss this on Twitter or maybe afterwards would be After, great. Uh, well, I don't know if you were tweeted and I retweeted it and the British parliamentarian Tom Watson tweeted back at me saying that's a great idea. <laughs> uh, so we have a, a British MP who was key in uh, questioning Murdoch already on our side. And I think it's the year, it really is a great idea. Citizen journalist for the Nobel Peace Prize 2011, that would be perfect. We're only halfway into the symposium, we're already going to win a Nobel Prize, which is a great start. <laughs> we're not citizen journalists? Well. Uh, okay, some of us will get to win a Nobel Prize. Um, Please be back here by 1.50 at 2 o'clock. We have an hour-long panel with three amazing projects that I think are really going to blow you away from the winners of this year's digital communities category of the pre-Ars Electronica. And then after that, we are going to start talking about China and Singapore and Germany and some of these countries that have been able to resist social change. Thank you. Thank you.